Hey, I'm Justin Pruitt with Olson & Olson. Um, I've been here for about three or four years now, and um, it's kind of awkward doing this in front of a camera, but hopefully just you can hang, hang with us. I think if I'm right, I think this is going to be on the second day of this presentation. So if you stuck with us this far, then man, good for you. And I hope you haven't fallen asleep. If you read the title of this thing, Emergency Services Districts and Sales Tax During COVID, if you haven't fallen asleep yet, then I mean, hang with me because we're trying to make this interesting. Um, on that note, I am not an expert in emergency services districts. I'm just not. And I'm not an, an expert in sales tax. And I'm not an expert in pandemic related issues, especially like macro or microeconomic effects of those things. Um, if you want experts, then you need to call these guys. For ESDs, call Kohler and Peeler. I got their number up there on their website. And if you have that on, on your slide, you should be able to click and go to them. They cover, they handle lots of ESDs and know, know them in and out. So go to them with any, with any questions you might have. Um, and then for sales tax, we're going to get a lot of this later. We're going to cover some of this in like really high level. But if you want to get some specific information about sales tax and what that means for your city, and especially now with bud, budget coming up, then you give Richard Fletcher a call. He's with HDL companies. I have his uh, email. I mean, his, his uh, website address and his email and his phone number right there. Um, and I'll repeat this later, but he is offering, this firm's offering free sales tax analysis for cities and special districts. Um, and so for, since it is budget season, that might be something that you really take advantage of. So give Richard Fletcher a call about that and he'll work through you and walk through maybe your recent sales tax receipts and what that means for your planning moving, moving forward. Uh, but even though I'm not an expert, um, we, can, we can go over this stuff in, in somewhat of a depth. We're still going to keep it pretty high level. Uh, we're going to cover like what are ESDs. Um, and then we're going to cover, we're going to take that as a big chunk. Then we're going to take another big chunk of what sales taxes in Texas. And another chunk of the presentation is going to be COVID's effect on sales tax in Texas. And then with those pieces, we're going to try to fit them all together to answer the question of what happened with emergency services districts during COVID and their sales tax receipts. And, it, and really, I think what you're going to see is it's not necessarily what happened to ESDs, but also like any, any city, any special district that has sales tax or even a county that has sales tax collections, um, you may you may have experienced some of this, you know, that we're going to talk about here. So even though we're talking about ESDs and sales tax and, and all that, keep in mind this is probably more lead, more going to fit feel like a geography type lesson than anything. And so all the things we're going to talk about, even though we could pick apart some of them, and the experts really could pick those apart in a lot of different ways, we're going to look at it more from a geography type perspective because I think when at the end of the day at least how we're going to look at this that's really how this is going to be perceived I think one one way to look at how sales tax have been collected is through the through the lens of geography um, but first let's talk about emergency services districts so section 48e of the Texas Constitution chapter 775 of the Texas Health and Safety Code they're the, they're the primary laws the primary you know statutes that, that govern ESDs um, the purposes in the Constitution for ESDs or they provide Medical services, amb ambulance services, rural fire protection and control. And then it says other emergency services authorized by the legislature. That's what if you look at Chapter 775, that's, that's where you're going to find all those listed. Um, how, how, are they, how are they made, ESDs? Well, generally what happens, you get a petition, um, you know, and it's kind of 100 signatures on the petition. Um, you know, that's collected, handed to the, to the county judge, verifies it, have a public hearing, and then elections held, you know, within the county to establish the... Um, Establish the ESD, um, and if, it, if it's in that county, if it's part of that part of that portion of that of the area, the ESD includes the city, then they have to give their their written response, usually like a resolution, just to say we support it, and then they'd be part of the um, part of the election. Most ESDs, again, it's, it's all it can be different, but most ESDs are governed by you know a board of five commissioners. Um, they're appointed by the commissioners' court. Some some commissioners are elected, depending on where they are. So this is, again, this is where the geography kind of comes in. So, you know, some like geographers or researchers, like macro and, and, and microeconomic researchers, and when they look at special districts, especially like ESDs, they use that as like, as like a litmus test for how development's happening. And if you think about it, that makes, that kind of makes sense. Um, because if, you know, if you have an ESD, like well, if it's there to serve, you know, provide fire protection and emergency services, and you wouldn't have that in a city that already provides that, or you wouldn't have it in an area of the county that already has that. So generally what you're going to see is like you'll have a city, maybe a small town, a city, and then you'll have, say they have a volunteer fire department that serves them and they, they get all the services from them. Everything's fine. 
But then you have a you know a huge chunk of undeveloped land. A developer comes in and they buy that land, and you have now you have a thousand homes, and maybe you already you already had a thousand homes in your city, and now you have you know a thousand more, so you doubled your population, and your volunteer fire department can't handle that much you know that that much new service, and the residents in that area they're going to want some kind of service, and so a lot of times that's where ESDs come into play is that the the, the you know the county will institute that ESD through the process, and then you know that that new area gets gets emergency medical service. Um, so that's and that's why that's why those researchers will look at that and they, if, they, if you see an ESD creation, you'll see them around areas that generally are have been developed like that. Um, so in Texas, there's over 300, um, and a, mo- a majority of those are in like the eastern to southeastern portion of the state. I don't know, you'll be able to see this at home, but but here, I mean, this is what that looks like. And I don't know how clear it is on on the on the video here, but the, the darker orange areas in Texas are where an ESD is located in that county. Um, and I've kind of zoomed in on that here and we're coming from Houston area. So in that area, you look like there's, I mean, over, I think it's over 60 or so in this area alone. And, uh, which again, if you're looking at, looking at that from a development standpoint, that means it's just a lot of residential development in areas that had no service or had, didn't have enough service, like a volunteer fire department that can handle the, the, the development. Um, so then how are they funded? Again, the constitution says that those, you know, those ESDs that are created, they, they can, charge up to or tax up to 10, 10 cents per hundred dollar valuation and most most leave it at that but some ESDs can also lev- levy a sales and use tax and that's again that's where this 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 presentation is going uh, but again think about not just ESDs but also cities and counties about about that sales and use tax um, so so what does that mean so for so that's, again, let me go back again so emergency services districts they can do that they can do that 10 cents and then they can also have a sales and use tax um, so Again, thinking of geography and that portion of, of, of the presentation is that so ESDs generally are around newly developed areas. They have the property tax, but in those newly developed areas, again, which is kind of near a city, um, they can, you know, maybe be able to use sales and sales and use tax. So that's the geography part of that. So skipping, so going from that into general sales tax in Texas. Um, so Texas tax code says that statewide sales tax is 6.25%. Um, so that anything that's gets sold, that's that's a, a taxable item, the state gets six point two five percent of you know the value of that item there added on to tax. Um, in addition to that, the tax code also allows you know a two percent uh, a two percent additional amount of sales tax to be added on top of that to go to special districts or cities or counties. Um, and that's in that in that little range is where of course this presentation is at, but that's also. Um, again, the question of what happened with in COVID with that extra two percent that some ESDs could tap into, um, and again, that just just a little more specific, specificity on that. So the two percent sales tax, you know, it's appropriate in one eighth increments. And I, there's been some recent, I mean, fairly recent change in this tax law. It used to be that you know one percent automatically went to a city, and then the, there was another one percent within that that got divvied up by one eighth percent. This tax code now looks at that it's it's one eighth increments all over, uh, but so generally what you'll see is that for special districts that are affected in, in like a in a city boundary, they're generally they're generally looking at how much in that extra one percent can they you know can they charge a one eighth or full one cent something like that. Um, that's again not not just for them too, but for for all of the special districts. Um, so if a city hasn't dedicated all of its 2%, and some cities do that, they get the whole thing, then there could be some allowance in that 2% cap that a certain, like a emergency services district, maybe a type A, you know, uh, economic development corporation, something like that could, could come in there and in, in, in one eighth increment could, could get some of that extra cap that's left over. So, um, so there, there is the potential Again, if you think about in those areas, geographically located areas where the ESD could be, there is the potential that they, you know, have a 10 cent ad valorem tax, a property tax, and then there is potential for them to have the 2%, um, you know, extra sales tax if, if there was an area, it's a city or something that didn't have that cap already taken. Um, not very likely, generally it's 1%, but but still there's that, that likelihood it could, could be that way. So that's ESDs. And then sales tax with ESDs. Now let's just look at one final part of the sales tax that is going to be very relevant, I think, to what we're talking about. So, just in general, sales tax. You know, before 
before this uh, Supreme Court decision, South Dakota v. Wayfair, there was, you know, the general understanding was that unless you had, unless a, a retailer had a physical location in the state, you know, they couldn't, you couldn't do, you couldn't do sales tax on it. Uh, but because of the, the internet, you know, and the way that that's changed, you know, all kind of commerce, um, Wayfair, you know, South Dakota was, was one of one of many states that did this, but they wanted to institute a, a sales tax on, on the company Wayfair because all the sales they were getting. So it went up, up, up to Supreme Court. 5-4 decision, the Supreme Court said, you know, you states can mandate that, can mandate, mandate sales tax for a business that doesn't have a physical location um, in a state if it has more than 200 tra transactions or $100,000 in state sales collection, uh, which, I mean, for these big guys, that's like no, that's no hurdle at all. And so, um, so because that came down, it's because of Wayfair decision, right after that, Texas legislature came back and they, you know, they codified that into law to what they call marketplace sales. And so again, same thing that you could, the, the state, could, you can charge sales tax, cities can charge sales tax on marketplace sales, like Amazon, those types of things. Um, you know, following, following that, uh, Wayfair decision. And the key, key point on that is that, that new law for Texas, again, based on Wayfair went into place on October 1st, 2019. And so the first timing of that, I mean, if you think about, so the sales, what that means from October, so it was the last quarter of, of 2019. So October, November, December, Christmas season, you know, online sales, Amazon, um, all those kind of sales, they, they were, those were taxable now. And so cities could have started seeing sales tax revenue from like Amazon during the Christmas season of 2019. But more importantly to this, to this presentation is that um, we know COVID came around in April of 2020. And so not only did, you know, the, that, that new tax law affect the Christmas season 2019, then you had, you know, January, February, March, and then April, 2020. So really only seven months after that thing, after that new law became affected, we got shut down and, um, it's hard to see here, but I mean, again, all, all this is intended to show is that, that that's, you know, the COVID, you know, that's how it's mapped out with all the, you know, hospitalizations and, um, and all the new cases and the unfortunate fatalities, uh, but all the, all the different things. And the points on that were really were what just to show is that Texas lockdown went, went into effect March 19th. Um, and then, you know, we stayed locked down essentially all the way through and until March 10th, essentially around this year. So about a full, again, more, a little more than a full year, we were on lockdown. And I mean, with sales tax, thinking about sales tax, of course, we think that, that would just kill everything. Um, and so just a general about the COVID's effect, and we, with through executive orders, the, you know, the governor put, you know, limitations on people, you know, meeting together, we had to have masks. Um, and then again, up until I think even last month, there was a, that's when the mask mandate got, got, lifted. So again, a year and a half of, of lockdown. Um, again, point is March, 2020 was a big uh, lockdown for Texans. So you think about lockdowns, you think about, and it gets into terms of, of sales tax and of, of commerce. These are the images that came to mind for me, you know, empty streets, no activity, not only no, no physical activity for, you know, for small retailers, that means no, no businesses, literally no business coming in your door. Um, again, this is like, this is Houston, at 8 p.m. on Tuesday, August 4th. So, I mean, nobody's there. And that usually is just bustling with people. That is that is rush hour on in Dallas on March 24th, right, as the lockdown happened. I mean, that should be jam-packed with cars, nothing. So, and this graph is supposed to show, I mean, again, you think of the lockdown, you think that that's what happened, sales tax, and next, this is what happened. Over from 2017, 18, 19, 20, well, then you see this dip. It was just a huge cut. And still, it was what the... Comptroller's office is saying is that it's 2.5 billion collected in March 2021. So that's, that's March 2021, even after a year of lockdown, is still down. The state's down 8.6 percent in sales tax revenue. And so I guess that if we were to cut it off there, we'd think, all right. So if you know if sales tax is down that way and ESDs have the potential to collect sales tax, then you know ESD just got annihilated. Just so did so did small cities and so did special districts. Counties, big cities, everybody got annihilated with sales tax, but that's not necessarily the case. So, because it was not that sales tax drop was not felt uniformly across the state. Um, generally, the big cities, Houston, Dallas, Austin, San Antonio, and those metro big metropolitan regions, um, they lost sales tax revenue in line with the state that big drop. Uh, but you, I mean, even even last week, you see you'll see news stories of counties and cities 
that have had just huge jumps in sales tax. And the question is like, how, how do they do that? And again, this is the answer is geography. So I think both the physical location of the cities and the patterns of behavior of the residents in those cities is a potential answer to why, even though we're shut, we're locked down, you know, nobody's moving. How did these cities gain sales tax? And it's not just a huge gain. It's, it's you know, I'm not little gains, it's, it's huge gains in some cases. Um, so again, this is more like theoretical microeconomics geography, but if you think about it, so what, what do you have, especially like in the ESDs that are, that are located in newly developed areas, generally you have, um, and, and with sales tax collection too, you think, think about it this way, that you'll have some kind of economic center, city, and then you'll have residents on the outskirts of that, whether that's like a Houston and you have a smaller cities on the outside, or you have the city and then, you know, a rural, a new development there. When lockdown happened, um, this image kind of shows that too, is that, you know, generally what happened is typically you'd have, you know, if there's two something million jobs in Houston, you know, you have 640,000 people coming in to do that and then about 400,000 leaving. And that's Census Bureau, you can get that kind of stuff from them. But that's just to show that there's movement of people into the major, into the major metropolitan areas. And then with that comes spending, comes tax dollars, of course, they're associated with that. Um, but the, because the lockdown, because the lockdown happened, people were forced to buy local for essential services, you know, and the non-essential services were like just to click away at Amazon. So like, you know, that's where you hear reports of local grocery stores and hardware stores, so huge gains. And then Amazon, you know, just having it right there, you can get anything you wanted to just by clicking away. Um, so for sales tax per, per set perspective, some small cities were benefited by the COVID lockdowns because it forced residents to spend money locally instead of like, like for instance, we have the city of, you know, Needville. That's one of the cities I represent. They, you know, c citizens were forced to stay there instead of going into Sugar Land north of them or even into Houston. The money stayed there in Needville and people also had their computers there and they were locked down in front of them. So, you know, if you wanted something, you just click on it and go. So Needville saw a huge sales tax receipt increase. Um, but that means that Sugar Land didn't see that, that money from Needville and Houston didn't see that money from Needville. And so that can kind of explain some of the, some of the discrepancies in the sales tax that you'll have some areas saw boom and some areas saw decline. Not true of everything, but that, that could, that's one way to, to see the, to see that, you know, the discrepancy between small cities gaining and big cities losing sales tax receipts. Um, so again, putting it all together, I mean, the ESD, for ESDs, if you have an ESD in a location that is on the outskirts of a smaller town, and which, again, if, if you follow the geographic, I mean, the, the ge geographic kind of research and they say that, then, I mean, the new, it means new development happen, new development happen. Those folks probably are more likely to use computers for their essential, non-essential services. Um, and they're not traveling, commuting in from that small town to the bigger place or whatever it's going to be. They're locked down there. They're using their computers. And then with the Wayfair decision that, you know, we have sales tax revenue from the online purchases now made available to a city in addition to the money spent locally at the grocery store, or hardware store. And I mean, it's, that's a boon for, for, for some cities. Um, so that means for ESDs, some of them saw an increase. Um, again, same thing, new, newer residential areas are covered by ESDs that are populated by commuters. Those people were locked down and their spending was local. And so the same thing for, for ESDs and other special districts and municipalities and, and counties. Um, if you saw more sales tax revenue during COVID, um, what, again, like, like I, the gentleman's name I mentioned earlier, that they're saying that don't use that as a litmus test for how you're going to be from now on. Because it could be something that the geography will recorrect re itself once the lockdowns and these things become back to normal, that those sales tax dollars will be flowing back like they normally do from the smaller towns into the bigger places and into the, or from the rural areas back into the city centers, you know, whatever scale that's going to be. Um, so you, they would say, just be, be, don't be too quick to think that you're just all of a sudden seeing a huge sales tax increase and that's going to stay that way because it may not. Um, they would encourage you to, to see and get analysis on that. And so just for, just for everything that there's, I mean, for every ESD is experiencing COVID pandemic, it's, you know, there's, there's no standard model for that. It's all different. Um, so again, again, I think I've said this a bunch of times, but I'm not, this is not intended to provide a specific answer for anything. It's a general idea of how to approach, you know, and how to, how to analyze what happened if you, if you experience a huge increase or a huge decrease in sales tax revenue during this lockdown period. And that 
that probably will balance itself out on both ends. Um, and so again, every situation involving sales tax should be reviewed and looked at independently. So I'm gonna throw his name up here again, but you need to talk to Richard Fletcher from HDL Companies. He is offering, HDL is offering free sales tax analysis for you, for your, for your city, for your county, for your special district. And, um, and I think if, if you're one of these folks that's seen a huge increase, or maybe even over the last, last few years, you've seen a steady increase all the way, and this just, just put more fuel to the fire, the COVID lockdowns did, then th these guys are really good about coming in and analyzing that and helping you plan, um, move forward, what to do with that revenue. And uh, especially since budget season's right here, that's, that's a good call to make. And again, if you have other questions with ESDs, then Kohler and Peeler are the way to go. Um, there's their addresses right there. Give them a call. Um, if, you have, if you're a city and you have issues about this or have other questions, maybe that are real specific and that I know that we zoomed through this and it was way, you know, 80,000 foot level. But if you have anything specific you want to ask, then feel free to contact me. There's my information and I'll do what I can with my non, you know, my not expert brain to try to help you out. Um, but anyway, if you have questions, email me, call me, and I'll be glad to do what I can to answer. Thanks for your time.